Uh, good morning. Um, right, I was asked to talk today a bit about uh, School for Startups and how we do what we do because I suppose um, I'm absolutely not an academic or a university educator, but we have a thing in common in that uh, School for Startups also teaches entrepreneurship. And it's amazing what you can do in perfect ignorance. And that is to say, when I started School for Startups uh, four and a half years ago, I blithely assumed, as many people who are entrepreneurial assume, that nobody did what I do, completely ignorant of the fact that the whole world did what I do. In fact, I didn't even realize that REE existed until I was invited to one a couple weeks ago. So it's amazing how profound one's ignorance can be. Um, and so I think that largely I can help inform the discussion today by talking a bit about if you do something with a clean sheet of paper and you approach the same problem everyone else has approached, how different your outcome can be and perhaps use it as a point of distinction. In the four years since, I've, I've actually become a normalized citizen and now I was guest teaching at Cambridge this past year on this subject and found out how it's done in a university context. Um, it's been an interesting experience for me and for Cambridge. Uh, the, uh, so School for Startups. School for Startups is a social enterprise in the British context. If you'd like to think of me, think of me as a British person with an American accent. Um, because I have actually gone deeply native. Um, I use British locutions. I'm, I don't smile as much. I'm not nearly as emotional as I used to be. Um, I was an American for a very long period of time but I have, I've lost that sense of charm and wit, and now I'm British. Um, so four years ago, four and a half years ago, I started the School for Startups as a social enterprise, and that's actually an important, I suppose, differentiating point in that in Britain, in the UK, social enterprises are, have become a well-accepted legal structure, and an understood one, but outside the UK, because in the UK, the UK, in fairness to it, is leading social entrepreneurship. There's more of it, the legal structures are more advanced, the funding mechanisms are more advanced, you've got quite sophisticated opportunities for patient capital and subrogated capital to move into not purely single bottom line oriented institutions. There's a lot going on there. But what's interesting, what's important about it is it is first and foremost an enterprise. The word social is the adjective in the relationship. It modifies enterprise, so it's a business at heart, therefore it has to have a bottom line and it has to make a bottom line. It is not charitable, it's not academic, it's not a public institution. Therefore, we have to earn our bread. This drives certain behaviors, as we all know, since we all teach entrepreneurship. Um, and so we started out broke, and we've made, remained, and I say quite proudly, resolutely broke ever since. How is that an accomplishment? Because we're not in debt. We're not negative. That's the goal of a social enterprise. It's not to make a profit, it's to avoid making a loss and we've done a superb job at that. We've managed to stay one, pen, sorry, one penny in front of um, death's door for four and a half years. And the other thing is we were unaware of what the, norm, the norms were, and our goal, to be quite blithe, was volume. I like things that are large. I like volume. I was an entrepreneur for most of my life. I liked growing business. So I wanted to see how much of a thing we could do. And so in the beginning, our goal was simply how many people we could teach. Not the quality of the teaching, not the outcomes, nothing of perhaps of substance, but how many people could be taught. And we approached it with a one-day boot camp approach initially. And over the last four and a half years, School for Startups has now taught, as of our latest numbers, about 18,500 people around the world. And this year, we're going to hopefully double up and get up to about 36,000 using short form teaching, one day and two day and three day boot camps. Our goal was, about two and a half years ago, was to test edge conditions. That is to say, if we were gonna do short form work, if we were gonna do a, what essentially is a light touch, just teach people for one day, the question is, how much could you teach in a day? How much could you accomplish? How much could you change? So we wanted the deepest one day. So if that was gonna be the broad, we wanted the deepest broad experience you could have. Two and a half years ago, we decided to test the other edge and have the broadest, deep experience you could have. So our other program that we started was a one-year program. We figured we'd have a one-day program and a one-year program and nothing in between. And for the one-year program, instead of trying to teach one or 10 or 20 young people how to get a business going, I shouldn't say young people, I mean young entrepreneurs who are actually quite age agnostic. But Instead of taking one or 10 or 20 and running through an incubator, we wanted to see if we could run a lot. 
And so we set up a program, and the first program actually managed to find funding in Eastern Europe, in Romania. And so we started School for Startups Romania, and we started with 250 entrepreneurs for one year to start 250 businesses across uh, Bucharest and Cluj. And now we're in the second year of that, and then we started our flagship program in London called the School for Creative Startups, and I'll touch on that in a moment. And we are teaching, a, we started 62 companies last year, and we're going to start another 100 this year. But then we thought, well, perhaps we could do this, though, in scale. And so this year we started our big program, which is in Nigeria, and we're, silent, we're working with, well, a lot of folks, but it's 1,250 startups across six regions in Nigeria, and we're distributing $50 million in startup capital across the country, or we're not, depending upon corruption. But in theory, we're distributing 50. I, I can proudly say I'm the only person in the world who's ever received an email from Nigeria saying, there's money waiting in a bank account for you. <laughs> and it was true. Yeah. In fact, it may be that my contribution to global society is that I am making more effective the best scammers on the planet. No, 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 no. Better ad copy, dude. You can't say it's a prince. They won't believe you. Yeah. Um, and so we started the program in Nigeria uh, earlier this year, and we're working with uh, the Nigerian Finance Ministry and DFID, which is the aid, export aid arm of the UK government and the World Bank. And the program kicked off under the name You Win Nigeria. 25,000 people applied for the program, 1,250 were selected. We've just finished the first round of teaching in June, of which I did about half. I, Paul, where are you? Where, I'm sorry, John, where are you? John Mullins. I tried to persuade him to come, but no, he's too busy. Um, that, was going, that was my putative other teacher, because currently I teach about 80% of the course, but I found some other sucker, I mean, another deeply uh, uh, academic person to come with me. And so we've taught all 12, 1,250, got them out of the boot camps, into the training. We've got 38 mentors on the ground, full time, who are monitoring and working with them. In theory, to teach them, also to deal with some minor corruption issues that exist in Nigeria, and to then hopefully get to the next set of boot camps. Half the businesses have started. I can say safely I am now um, more knowledgeable about cassava processing and snail farms than anyone in the room, unless there's somebody else who knows about the growth of snail farms in Nigeria. I am, I am totally au fait with this now. Um, it is interesting to me. It's interesting to me that you can do deep work broadly and that you can do broad work deeply. That is to say, I think it is valuable to ask the questions, how many people can you touch? Now, admittedly, I'm not as, I am being somewhat disingenuous in the sense that we do measure outcomes a lot. I do care about how many businesses start, how many prevail, how many succeed. But what I less care about, and what I disagree, I guess, with um, the count earlier of the balance between technology and business is I don't give a shit about technology. I truly don't. Because entrepreneurship, first of all, technology is not a sector. We must stop thinking that. Technology underpins any business in the 21st century. And therefore, the differentiating factor of the most effective trout farm in Romania is sensors. It's, it's a sensor business. It's a business that uses very low cost, easily available sensors, and their differentiation is the software they've created to monitor the sensors to keep the trout alive at a further distance than what used to be kept from the supermarkets where trout is sold fresh, so that they therefore have a more, a lower cost economic base and a more robust supply chain that permits them to deliver more fresh trout. It's not about trout farming. That's a 21st century business. It's as high tech as anything you'll find anywhere in the world, but it's a trout farm. And cassava processing in, in the, is just on the southern border of Lagos is driven largely by micro factories. Just as they applied small, steel, small factory technology to steel production about 15 years ago and changed the nature of steel production from large factories to small, and therefore micro plants permitted greater variability and higher quality of steel on a more variable production basis, so too you can do the same with more basic foodstuffs like cassava because cassava is both something you eat and something you use to create starch to wash clothing with. And therefore, if you can have variable production runs against changing, shifting spot prices, you can end up with a better economic return. Guess what it is? It's a tech model. It's cassava processing. Technology touches everything. Thus, if we think about ourselves as helping start tech firms, you're talking about the tool, you're not talking about the business. One of the, th where this came to light to me was in the UK context. In the UK, right now, 
there's a great deal of effort going to becoming a fake Silicon Valley. Who wants to be a fake anything? Who wants to be second tier to anybody? I don't envy Stanford. Stanford's lovely, but they're out in California. I live in London, a much more interesting place. I live in the center of the world, not out on the last time zone before the ocean. Have you ever tried to do business in California? Everyone else is already asleep or they've gotten to tomorrow already. It sucks. I worked in LA for 20 years. Everybody had already done business for the day by the time I woke up. That's not the center of the world. That's the edge of the world. The center of the world's over here. And London is a really interesting city. And so what I've militated the UK government in favor of is stop being second best and back your advantage. The UK, London in particular, is a conflation of things that the US, by comparison, has inadvertently segregated. We have in LA, I was an LA entrepreneur, I was never a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. I was always involved in things like special effects and graphics and film and TV. And so much of the enterprise, many of the businesses I started largely had two groups of people, people who were devoutedly creative and people who were deeply technical and viewed themselves as being in different worlds and who had communication challenges with each other. Though in spirit, if you were a Martian from a distance and looked at them, you'd think they were the same people. They were autistic, they looked at your shoes when they were being social, they couldn't communicate and they thought they were better than everyone. See? That's creatives or technologists. They're the same, actually. They just didn't talk to each other. And so, from my point of view, they were all very similar. But what is interesting is, in LA, we had a huge hub of creativity, mostly centered around film and TV. In New York, we have a huge hubs of media-driven creativity, and in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area, largely, we have the whole tech industry. In London, they conflate. You have fashion design, radio, TV, and you have what I would call light tech, i.e. web stuff. But they're all adjoining, they all rub each other, their shoulders are hitting each other. And thus you have end up with interesting startups that wouldn't happen in the US. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Natalie Massonet. If you're, if you're an educator, if you're a woman who makes enough money, you'll know who she is. She runs a, a company called Netta Porte, which is a company that sells high quality women's fashion to women over the web. And it's doing awfully well. It's a really interesting company from my point of view because it characterizes a London type of startup. You could not have started net a -Porte in the Valley because nobody in the Valley knows anything about women's clothing and there's not a VC she could pitch to that believed you could sell high fashion women's clothing over the web. They didn't even know high fashion. They thought handbags cost something that the cost of a handbag related to its cost of manufacture. And we all know that a handbag is far more important than that. That a handbag is a sign of identity. A handbag is, I know way too much about handbags now. It's almost as though I have a secret vice, but having now backed three handbag companies this past year, I know handbags, as no other man can. And I'm starting to learn about high heels. <laughs> I'm moving abroad. Um, but it's very interesting, because in talking to Natalie, what you'll find is, because she, she tried to get some venture money in, from the States, mostly from what I would consider traditional technology-driven venture capitalists. And of course, they didn't get it. They thought about it as an e-commerce business. She said, E-commerce is how we're going to do it, but that's not what we're about. And if you look at the, th the reason, I mean, they're doing what? They're trading 600 million this year. This is a big step up in a few years. That's a proper win. I'm sorry, that's in pounds, so in dollars it's more. But it's a proper business, and she's gone very quickly. But what sets the business aside, leaving aside the fact that she's doing what they didn't think could be done, is the differentiators are things that I have never seen and would have never seen in a web startup on the West Coast. She has her own shoots. That is to say, she has a series of photography studios built into the heart of the business, and she reshoots every product. That is not the standard in e-commerce, I promise. You, never, you don't bother to reshoot, it's a huge expense. Why does she do it? Because how she sells the product is the unique look that net porte gives to products, to clothing. She knows what it needs to be done with that photography in order to present it in a way that makes sense in a web context. So is this an e-commerce business? No. Is it a creative business? Yes, it is. It's actually a fashion business that happens to be leveraging technology. In that spirit, a year and a half ago, because London is in many ways one of the creative centers of the world, we started the School for Creative Startups. It's an avowedly non-tech incubator. My theory being is, Everybody else had an incubator for tech. I'm deeply contrarian by nature. I would do the one that wasn't about tech. In fact, if you were tech, I wouldn't let you in. 
doesn't mean anything, nobody from tech applied, but I wanted to be able to say that. And in the first year, about 62 businesses came through the program. We've just opened our second year. And what's interesting about that program is it's also a test bed for a number of other things. It takes no money from anyone. So the whole, and thus runs at a deep loss, but it's, the goal is to get itself sustaining. And by next year, it will actually be running at a profit, which is interesting because 90% of the students pay less than 600 pounds for the year. So we don't make money off the people who run the program. In fact, the only reason we ask any money of them at all is because it's been my experience, if you make them pay something, their view of what they're doing changes. So at 600 quid a year, it covers nothing. The cost us per student is in the neighborhood of 3,500 pounds. And we will make money in other ways. We're running what's hopefully gonna be the next, the largest uh, showcase for new fashion and design in London this year. And we've got sponsors piling in and they don't know what to do with their money as usual. So we're letting them pay for things. We're setting up funding circles and private equity and a venture capital fund to back them. And all those things, of course, throw off cash because as any VC will never tell you, there's a lot of cash and it's not in the carry. So these things turn money into the incubator, so they pour it back. And it's a nice self-thriving model. And I think that's very important because most of the work we've done at School for Startups in the first four and a half years has depended on the largesse of others. So I've gotten very good at working with governments and extracting money from governments around the world, but that is not a sustainable vision. And therefore, if we want to run sustainable activities that is deep and yet the broadest version of deep and that creates real outcomes and turns out lots of businesses, then I think one has to ask questions like, well, what sectors are to your advantage? Does technology underpin everything you do? Do they end up with businesses at the end? Can it be self-sustaining? And how many people can you reach? Aside from that, it's a piece of cake. Um, I said I'd speak for about 20 minutes and talk for about 20, so I shall come to a conclusion with a story. Um, the other thing that I've learned in the last four years in teaching entrepreneurs, because I am admittedly a novice in the activity, is that even though I like to believe, no, even though I wish it were the case that everyone's the same all over the world, it's just not true. There is more to successfully growing entrepreneurs than the sheer enthusiasm of people of a certain age or under a certain age. And two things have become glaringly clear. One, that there is an age, and I'm not sure what year it is. If I had to guess, I'd say it's somewhere between 25 and 30, closer to 25, under which the people are different than over which. And what I'm really referring to is this extraordinary transformation of who people view as their peers and their comparators. So when I'm standing in Bucharest this year, it was sort of abruptly brought home to me when a young, I was talking to a young entrepreneur who happens to be a tech entrepreneur, and I was asking about his competition, just typical questions that might happen in a normal discussion with an entrepreneur, and he was talking about people his age in other countries, as though they were next door. His view of the world was informed by the perfect liquidity of conversation and communication that has disrupted this generation. He is completely conversant with the latest gossip in the valley and in other places in the world, and in fact, more balanced than I'd say than many people who sit in Silicon Valley are looking out because of the myopia that American firms frequently have as to the rest of the world. After all, no other type of, cor no other corporation in the world identifies a part of the world as rest of world except an American corporation, right? The way we divide corporations up is we've got U.S. and international. In international, we have EMEA and this fantastic thing called ROW. ROW means rest of world, right? That's us, by the way. Dude. <laughs> um, and so I just always found it, you know, that there is this potential for myopia. But if you, th if you sort of tease back the myopia factor and start looking at it just by an age lens, there is something amazingly different under a certain age going on at the same time. And I noticed it teaching both in Eastern Europe and in Africa, and that is that if they're under a certain age, they are completely conversant with peers saying their comparators, their networks are global. It just wasn't true even a few years ago. If I was teaching a few years ago, they would view the local context. They would look forward to people who are more successful than them, who are older than them. They would look to their side, to their local peers, and they don't anymore. And that is 
different. And it's change, the change has come up with the rise of Facebook and Twitter largely. I mean, you can point to very specific things that are causing it. That was one change that, has, that I think holds great promise for entrepreneurship as a tool for social change. The other thing, less optimistic, is that there is a bit of a challenge in countries where rule of law is an option. That's not here. But, and it's not in the UK, the most ridiculously honest nation I've ever lived in. To a fault, as they'd say. But where you don't have rule of law, where rule of law, and therefore rule of contracts, are not mandatory, are not part of the social milieu, it is very difficult, and I do wonder, if possible, to promote entrepreneurship successfully. If whether the context and the absence of the security of rule of law is absolute predicate to this success, and whether those nations that don't enjoy it can meet with success. And for me, it's a living experiment. Because when I compare, and I don't really have an answer yet, but we're doing lots of studies on it, of our own sort. And when I look at the struggle we have in the Romanian context, and it's a struggle, it is our most challenging environment, and the amount of success we are having in Nigeria, two countries where rule of law in both instances is optional, where corruption is even more endemic. Now, it's interesting. The corruption is more endemic in Nigeria, but the, per the corrosive effects of the post communist era are more corrosive on the societal desires of the Romanian population, I'd say the history of Romania holds them back more than the current corruption in Africa. Now, is that a rational comparison? I don't know, but I'm trying to find reasons why I'm meeting with so much more success in a Nigerian context than I am in a Romanian context. Now, the good news for me is I'm going to have a few other places to play my experiment out this year since we're in discussions in Sao Paulo and Mumbai. So who knows? what my comparison will look like a year from now. What I do know is this, is that it doesn't stop the entrepreneur, but it definitely shapes their perception of what it means to be an entrepreneur. And so when I taught my last class in Nigeria, during the first Q&A session, somebody raised their hand, and they said, I just have one question. It's a financial question, Doug. I said, fine. He said, do you capitalize your bribes and put them on the balance sheet, or do you just expense them and leave them on the P&L statement? I don't have an answer for that question. <laughs> you know, it's a good question, you know, because if you think about it, I said, well, it really depends, I suppose, on whether they stay bought, doesn't it? Because you, if you bribe somebody to stay bought, well, that's an asset. So you should capitalize it and depreciate it. But if you just have to pay and pay and pay, that's just an expense. <laughs> Problem is, I was telling a joke. He took me so seriously. He's writing notes down. <laughs> it's like, what depreciation schedule? I don't know. What's the half-life of a judge, you know? <laughs> yeah. I then had to unwind the whole conversation. I know I was joking. <laughs> You're not supposed to bribe people. And he goes, well, then you don't know how to do business. I said, clearly not. Right, that's definitely the way place to leave a conversation on entrepreneurship. I did agree I'd open it to some questions. Thank you very much for indulging me. Okay. Actually, we have a special... Uh, oh, we do. What's your name here. again? So, um, yeah, Timo, come here. So Timo's a really cool entrepreneur. Describe what you got. Right, so this is a microphone. Uh, we developed this actually during the summer, the summer of startups. And we're a very early startup called the Catchbox. And it's a throwable microphone. And the idea here is that when we have larger audiences like this. Timo, does it really need explanation? <laughs> Let <Okay>. me guess. <laughs> May I borrow for a second? Who's got a question? <laughs> oh, please? You can't catch it? That's quite all right. There's a young man right in front of you. Yeah, I'm looking at you too. Stand up. Timo, throw it to him. Yeah, you. Don't look behind you. Either one of you. He can catch it. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much for taking that. <laughs> a picture is worth a thousand words. Oh, never worry about the demo. <laughs> Talk into the box. Oh, this, is, this is lovely. It is um, cool, isn't it? I want to buy one. Yeah. My name is Inke Ruth. I work for government funding agency. And um, so I'm just funding. And um, I was interested about your story of Nigeria. How did you end up there? What was that? I mean, Africa is great and it's huge, and, but how did you end up there? So if one sort of, I'm going to oversimplify slightly, but if you break down global economies by pace of growth, 
you've got at the top, and you add into factor the size of the absolute size of the economy. You have at the top, if you multiply the two of them, the BRIC countries. But then below them, you have smaller economies that are growing at the same pace. You're talking about economic growth in the 7 to 12 percent range, and those are what are informally frequently referred to as the signet countries. And there's about a, half, a dozen countries that are growing at those paces but don't have the same size economies. They're my core area of interest. And so I started by asking, we asked ourselves the question, which economies have that kind of growth? So, because that's a great fertile base in which to be working, but then need the infrastructure help. Nigeria, of course, is the growth leader in Africa, 160 million people, ex largest exporter in Africa. I mean, it's a bursting economy in many ways. So I started with the top-down view. Once we'd established that, I then did lots of reach-out activities. The two countries in particular that I ended up doing some advisory work with were Nigeria and Colombia, both in the same sort of cohort. And it, then it comes down to personalities. Um, the Nigerian government is fortunate enough to have Ngawe, the new finance minister who was at the World Bank, come back. She said, no more corruption. She said, we need entrepreneurship. And her personality has driven that. And I was fortunate enough to meet her doing the advisory work. And one thing led to another. Well, and she had $50 million. <laughs> Fine, it, that helps, I have to admit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, um, who else would like to catch a mic? Okay. All right, you have to now throw it. Okay. Hey, whoever holds the mic wins. Well, I also appreciated your comments about uh, Nigeria and Romania, but we are in Western Europe in an economy which is not growing anymore with seniors, apparently, are not entrepreneurs. So when you went to the University of Cambridge, what did you say to the students? Do you know stupid? It's not about tech? Or I don't, think you, I don't think you should ever tell Cambridge students they're stupid. Because uh, they, they, they're smart and they might take offense. Um, so I've been teaching there now. I, it's, this is my second year, I, second, maybe third, I don't know, a couple of years now teaching. And where I've been teaching, just so you understand the context, is in the combined, the combined PhD nanotech program between MIT and Cambridge. So it's about as tech as it gets. And so it's telling them ignore tech, I don't do that either. Yeah, and this is a course, and the course is literally a course that I've re-entitled Impact. It, it started out as a course entitled Entrepreneurship, but you're not going to get these extremely bright people, and these are the top nanotech students, well, some of them are top nanotech students in the world. If you say you need to be entrepreneurial, you're picking for them one of the pathways to impact, and that's a mistake. Because they are starting, their love rate at this moment in their career, their love is their research. The, the intellectual fervor they bring to it, their passion is channeled through a desire to do research. So my challenge, appropriately enough, is for them to appreciate what impact their research can have. And entrepreneurship is merely one vehicle for impact. It's one way to take what they're doing and change the world. Publishing is fine. It's a way to have impact but it's just one way. And so the goal, for my goal for them, was them to see that there's, across their career, they're gonna have many different pathways to impact. And so I ask them, I start the semester and I ask them a question. Do you want to be remembered? Because if you don't want to be remembered, that's fine. But if you do want to be remembered, then you must make an impact on the world. And you're not gonna make an impact if you don't think about making an impact. It doesn't make itself. And therefore, if you're going to do research, ask what impact could that research have and how are you, and are you not responsible for making it have that impact? You can gift it to the world, but then you have to intentionally gift it to the world. The work, for example, that Kevin Cullen did at University of Glasgow in freeing up the entire IP of the University of Glasgow intentionally and saying, it's free, it's just sitting on the shelf, we're not doing fuck all with it, feel free. Make, a dip, make an impact, I think, is interesting academically, and it's interesting as an impact statement. Because the fact of the matter is, you can license something and charge nothing for it, but keep all sorts of control over that license. There's all sorts of great rubber bands you can attach to intellectual property that have nothing to do with financial impact. And so what I wanted them to do is to start thinking about all the routes to impact research can have. As it happens, once they start thinking that, some of them start thinking about entrepreneurial outcomes because they start doing the right analysis. They start saying, right, I'd like to have an impact. Good, we're now in the right place. Once they start thinking they want to have an impact, they ask, what would it take for the kind of innovation I'm doing to have an impact? And some innovations require capital. 
Once it requires capital, it's easy for me to show them why entrepreneurship might be valuable. Because then it gets housed in a company or it gets licensed to a business. Then they're engaged in making sure. But I remind them, your goal is to shepherd your innovation to impact. And then you now have a relationship with them that's meaningful to them, given that at that moment in their life, they're interested in their research. They're not, largely not interested in entrepreneurship. And so I don't try to sell them entrepreneurship. I try to sell them an impact. And that's work as well as can be done with that particular group of people. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. You have to turn, you can't raise your hand without watching for a flying mic. Oh, I love this device. Uh, Doug, in addition to traveling around the world, you've traveled extensively around the UK. Yeah. Uh, doing your workshop in UK universities. You've had a great platform to do you know, UK's attempts to incorporate entrepreneurship and education into university curricula. Yep. I didn't touch much on that today. What's your reflection on the, current, you know, the, the highs and the lows, the goods and bads of, sort of your, your experience? With the My interaction with the higher education the higher institutions of the UK? The, the glorious higher education institutions of the UK, of which you see a little one. Yeah. Um, and I will make sure to be really nice about that one. Um, <laughs> or I'm not coming back. As Dave points out, I mean, the School for Startups has always affiliated ourselves in one way or another with universities across the UK for our UK programs. We've worked with some 35 universities. Um, it ranges from unbelievably great to the opposite. Um, the opposite being slightly less than perfect. Um, what, is, what is, the thing that I find most challenging is the most disheartened people I find are the enterprise educators. The fact of the matter is, certainly in the UK context, so I can't speak globally, but in the UK context, they do a lot of heavy lifting and they get very few rewards. They're usually not inside the business schools, which at least have a home and a logic to them. People understand a business school. They're usually floating. We're usually stuck in other departments. They're treated as second-class citizens because they're viewed as some sort of slightly smelly vocational training for people who couldn't follow the rules. It's not, you know, academic, though I do find this to be an entertaining fallacy as I'm sitting around looking at vocational training to the left and to the right. I got medicine over here, which is a bunch of plumbers of the body, engineers over here, which are plumbers of iron. Those are vocational training. And accountants who think they're even better than all of us, if that's not vocational training, I sure shit don't know what it is. But entrepreneurship is a slightly less prestigious. There is a certain hierarchy of prestige even within high prestige vocational training. And enterprise educators are viewed pretty much as a second class set of citizens. So when I come to a university and we partner, they're happy to see me. Because they we're an imported program, which means we can do stuff that's not necessarily lined up with a semester or an agenda. We're free to act more abruptly. We're free to set up programs that don't necessarily conform to academic qualification. And that's useful for them sometimes. So we can be a catalyst. Um, if you recall the enterprising academic program that I ran last year across the UK, which was largely about taking my Cambridge experience and doing it on a broader curricular scale and then teaching teachers to teach graduate students how their research could have an impact. That was really successful, though it was largely well, it was largely in Russell Group, but out of the top tier. And for those of you who are not in the UK context, that would mean it would have been within the top 40 educational institutions, but not in the top five or six that have attitude, um, in which category UCL squarely falls. Uh, you know, it's, well, it's the challenge of being a top university, is they, you, you view it as being everything's available, right? Every top university truly believes we've got it all. And in some ways they do, right? The problem is it's not usually joined up. It may or may not be best practice, but it's inside the university and therefore it's understood and loved to that degree. So I've had a mixed response from universities, I guess would be the honest answer, but it's been largely successful because we're viewed as non-threatening because we don't stick around. The university largely has no financial obligation just because we do everything for free. All we ask of them is a room and a cup of coffee oh, and their participation, and they can, they can handle that. Um, so we've had modest success, I think. I mean, I'm running the new program now, and that's been tough to get out the door, the Entrepreneurial Institution. This is a nationwide program in the UK that we're just starting that works with universities, not just in the context of 
um, teaching the researchers, but also working directly with the undergraduate students, the graduate students, and the management of the university itself, because the UK university system is going through a revolution right now, and they are being forced to be far more entrepreneurial because they're charging tuition now, and they're charging real tuition, and this has had unbelievable consequences for the whole UK system for quite obvious reasons. Burton, you seem to be holding the box. Uh, Burton Lee, Stanford Engineering. I'm currently working in Colombia, along with Europe, and some of Colombian cities, long history traditions of sort of violent terrorism bombs yep. because of the drug trade. How do you segment out um, barriers to entrepreneurship around violence, mm -hmm. uh, corruption, as you mentioned, in Nigeria and in Romania, which was more about, I think, informants, people informing on each other, a little bit of violence, but mm -hmm. How, how do you, what's your experience around violence issues and its, its effect on a, a trust and entrepreneurship? Um, I can speak in the Nigerian context about violence, Burton. Because um, we never got an entrepreneurship program off the ground in Bogota. We, I only ended up doing the advisory work. Uh, well, I can start on two levels. One pl impact of violence is I end up being shepherded around by three guys carrying AK-47s. Um, in Nigeria. Um, I used to think that was an awful thing, but the way they can cut through Lagos traffic is amazing. Um, I mean, Nigeria, there's proper issues there, right? I mean, if you're going to teach in places like Nigeria, you have to accept the fact that there's a terrorist group named Boko Hadron, which translates pretty literally into English as death to Western educators. I per take particular offense at this, being a Western educator, so I call it the death to Doug terrorist group, you know custom designed for me. And they're a problem, right? I mean, even as we were running our boot camps in Abuja, I can't go to the north, right? Because the north of Nigeria currently is simply too unstable. And so I ran, I brought all the northern students down to the middle of the country to Abuja, the capital. But even as we were doing it, one of my, uh, there was a, um, an explosion in one of the northern universities and one of my monitors was seriously injured and we were unable to get them down. And of course he was in the hospital and could have died. So it's a very, these are very real issues. The, the, so just the teaching of entrepreneurship is affected by the implications of violence, or the threat of violence, I guess I would be. It casts a pal on our ability to move and to have actions. Furthermore, they're right. That is to say, Boko Haram is completely right. Western education and Western educators are absolutely a threat to their worldview. We are. They are correct to hold me out as a challenge to the way they view the world. That's the reason I'm there. I am a challenge to their worldview. I disagree. I think that people should be self-empowered. Self-empowerment is what entrepreneurship is about in that context. And you can't divorce it. We're talking about views of the rights of an individual in society and the relationship of that individual to that society. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about redistribution of wealth. Terms that are in the American tax are very discomforting, actually. I can't stand up in the middle of the Midwest and talk about redistribution of wealth. They'd run me out on a something. But that's what we're talking about. It's just the tool for redistribution is the self-empowerment that comes through entrepreneurship, which means you have to have enough freedom, enough elbow room in the society for people to do that. People forget the Arab Spring started by what? a young Egyptian who was not allowed to sell something. It was a commercial restriction that started the entire wave of violence. It was the right to have, earn a living, the right to feed your family. It's these kinds of things that make this in a very emotive discussion in many places. And the fact of the matter is, I am a scaredy cat. I don't, I, I, I find some things frightening. So I have only chosen where we've worked to the limits of my Bravery. So we were offered the opportunity to work in the occupied zones in Palestine, and I said, perhaps later. Because I'm just not sure that a good New York Jewish boy should be dropping in to the occupied zones teaching entrepreneurship just yet. You know, hold that thought. But I, I don't think I have a core answer to you in terms of the, the question you'd really like answered, which is, how does that impact on entrepreneurship? I think the answer is, it comes down to a question of the relationship of the individual society, and these things are threatening. To certain worldviews. One more question? All right. You can ask it. Pause. If you can't Pause. throw it. Yay. Hi, I'm Vikas Rajput from India. Uh, you were talking about uh, starting something in Mumbai. So, can you please tell me a little more and uh, how do you see entrepreneurship education in Indian context? 
I don't know much about entrepreneurship education in India. I know that Mumbai is one of the creative centers of the world, and School for Creative Startups, we'd like to open a Mumbai uh, facility. The notion with School for Creative Startups is slightly different. This is, once again, an idea at this point, because we currently only have the one program in London. But I really, truly believe that, especially when it comes to creative businesses, that we will benefit the startups more if we can be running in creative centers, where there's already lots of creative activity going on, and create those cross connections. Because as you and I both know, a creative business gets its leverage on the free travel of its IP. And therefore, if I can take a young fashion designer out of, um, say, Colombia, as I happen to have done, I'm sorry, no, she came from Mexico City, and we transported her into the London context, she was already doing interesting work. So what we did is we moved her to the London context, ran her through the first year program, made sure she had the ties, the customer chains in front of her, but now she's back in Mexico City for her supply chain side. She's now a small yet global business and growing fast. But you need to actually move the person, actually, is my belief, for a period of time so that they're in both contexts. Because if she just sat in Mexico City and tried to grow her business, she never would have had the world view, that sort of ability to understand what it takes to get on the catwalk in London Fashion Week. And she would have thought it as an insurmountable problem when really it was a cheap plane ticket and two introductions. Because her designs speak for themselves. The problem is nobody hears what she has to say if she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I think that there is huge collateral value in having multiple School for Creative Startups in multiple creative places and then moving back and forth. The fact is, Hollywood, Lagos, and Mumbai are the three centers for film production on, in the world. But most independent film production financing doesn't see that yet. There's lots of opportunity. We just have to kind of connect up some dots. Right. Last, last question. Hi, Colin Howard, Technical University of Denmark. Um, just reverting back a couple of questions ago to the enterprise units at university. Um, there's an expression, what gets measured gets done. Um, and generally speaking, the academics get measured on funding, publications, these types of things. Right. I was wondering whether you've seen any measures to measure um, entrepreneurship output from university educators. That's a great question. But usually I compliment the question when I'm trying to avoid my absence of having an answer. Um, so, in the spirit of trying to do my small bit to help governments, uh, the last program we ran for the UK government, we volunteered to uh, a set of measures, of outcome measurements that no person taking money from a government had ever signed up for before because nobody would ever want to because then they would never get money again. But in the theory being that one should just do entertaining things, I worked with Dr. Stockdale at the London School of Economics who is the head of their statistical measurement unit, and I brought her and her team in and said, what can be measured? Now, this particular program was one of our biggest programs. It was uh, working with small businesses across the UK to teach them how to use the internet to drive top and bottom line. So we're looking for easy wins in small businesses, but it's largely entrepreneurship education under another guise. So what we ended up with doing with Dr. Stockdale is we did a series of measures. We did a baseline measurement of all 5,000 businesses before the program, we did a measurement of their, and we tried to measure quant. So we were measuring top line, bottom line, number of employees, measurements of growth, export, and we, we tried to pick about six or seven key measurements up and down a P&L and a balance sheet, in addition to softer measurements. So what kind of investment were they making based on the kind of work we'd done? Had they shifted priorities, stuff like that? We measured before they started, immediately upon the end of the program, and now we are just doing the six month later measurement now. Our biggest challenge, of course, is getting them to participate. So we've been focused far more on how do we bribe them to participate than on anything else, because you've got to get the participation, and small businesses are notoriously difficult to get the attention of. So I'm bribing them with the free another course if they just help me measure this one, on the theory that if I get the measurement right, it will all be a self-fulfilling success, and if I get it wrong, well, fuck it. <laughs> Nobody will ever know because it never happened. Um, the government's very excited because no one's ever measured this before. I'm slightly concerned that I've stepped up to this um, because, as you know, when you actually measure stuff that matters, it sometimes doesn't work. 
Um, but I'm happy if you're interested afterwards, I can in introduce you to Dr. Stockdale and she can in give you a very detailed understanding of the entire very painful methodology, because it is painful, as you can imagine. One last short question. Where are you? Need to get the box. Sure. Then you need the box. You need to be able to catch. There you go. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, and I'll be happy to look at the opportunity in terms of what you are trying to see in Mumbai. Okay. Let's trade cards afterwards. All right. Thank, thanks a lot. Doug. Thank you very much, everyone.